Welcome to this week's episode of the Prep Athletics Podcast. From Loomis Chafee in outside of Hartford, Connecticut, we've got Coach Rock Battistoni. Now, Rock has been there for uh, almost 10 years now, and he has done something that's pretty unique, especially when, at the time when he did it. But he went to prep school, he played three years at Salisbury, and then went to St. Lawrence, right, D3 school in upstate New York, where he was the rookie of the year in the conference. And after two seasons there, he ended up bumping up and transferring to D1 to play at George Washington. So it helped. He grew three inches his freshman year at St. Lawrence, and the game kind of clicked, and he talked about what led to that click. But he talks about the transition from D3 to D1, especially back in the days when it wasn't as um, as popular as it is now. Talked about playing professionally in Germany after that, coaching, prep school, single A versus double A and triple A, placing kids nowadays, and much, much more. So really excited to have uh, Coach Battistoni on the podcast. Stick around. I hope you enjoy it. Thanks for tuning in. Welcome to the Prep Athletics Podcast. This is Corey Heights. Some battles. I'm not, I'm not sure if they got us. If they did, maybe. maybe. So you will get better as a player during that year. So it was kind of exciting. Like, oh, yeah, somebody wants me. Rock, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me. I uh, really, really appreciate the, uh, the opportunity to be here. Yeah, and uh, appreciate you coming on too. And uh, you went to a prep school back in your high school days. Tell me about that decision you and your family made to to make that jump. I did. I um I went to Salisbury School. Um, so all all boys, Northwest Corner, of Connecticut, and I grew up out that way. Probably forty five minutes. Um, you know, th- there is no highway uh, <laughs> to get from Morris, Connecticut, to to Salisbury, but um. Yeah, I went there as a as a repeat tenth grader from public school to prep. Um, really, kind of when when prep school started to to take off a little bit in terms of um, you know having this this uh, this uh, level of basketball um, and um, you know being you know, in a in an academic environment where there's a lot of structure to it. It really started, I think. Gain some, gain some ground in, I don't know, late nineties or so, but, um, it, it was, it was the right fit for me, the perfect situation for me. Um, so. And how'd you find out about Salisbury? Like was someone helping you or did you hear about it from a friend or a coach? I, I think it was more, I, I can remember like hearing about it, but it was kind of like, um, taking a look at it and my folks being like, this is the perfect place for you. That that's how it happened. That's how it happened. I think, and maybe my folks had a family friend um, whose son went there, but um, that ne- necessarily wasn't, uh, you know, the, the the determining factor for me to to land at Salisbury. Um, it was a number of factors, and and it was the right place for me. And we didn't. It's not like how it is now, where you have maybe you know folks who may might look at a bunch of schools. It was kind of like let's go take a look, and then you're going to go there, and, and that's it. How many years were you at Salisbury? So I was three years. I did three years. Okay. Yep. And what are the big things you took away from your experience there? Man, um, so much. I mean, it's an incredible place. Um, and like I said, it was a perfect place for me um, to grow as as a as a young man and as a player and, and as a student. Um, I mean, what I take away most now is like the, the relationships that I was able to to create. I mean, my roommate. We lived together for three years. He was an, an LA kid who ended up going to Tulane. He was an incredible player and, and and just a great dude. And um, you know, maintaining those connections still and being in the, in that network was really what I what I still take away from from being there. Um, yeah, it, it was incredible. Upon graduation from Salisbury, you chose to go to Sarah Lawrence. And what was your thinking on choosing that school, Rock? St. Lawrence, actually, St. Lawrence. Saint, um, Saint Lawrence. No. Um, well, it's, you know, like any six, six soaking wet, 175 pound kid. Um, I, I had, I had remember being like on the radar of some division one spots, um, and having some potential, but really on my, on my team, I was like the fifth option, maybe wow. even the sixth option, but a starter because we had my roommate who was unbelievable. And then we had a kid who was actually like one of the top sophomores in the country. And I think in fact, he was, he was ranked above LeBron James in that class. 
Um, and then we had some, some other talent. So I wasn't necessarily like a focal point of my high school team, um, which was okay, but I, but I still had, had been doing enough um, to get some, some schools interested from some Division One, some, some Patriot League places and some MAC schools and things like that. Um, but it was different then. And, and where we are now, it's, it's, it's just we're in a crazy place. And, <laughs> and I think that um, there were a couple other Division three schools. And eventually it's like you, you need to make a, a choice. And I know I wanted to go to a really good school. I knew I wanted to get kind of far away from home. And, and um, upstate New York, Canton, New York is, is just far away from home. Um, and Coach Downs, Chris Downs, who's still the head coach there, um, fought like heck to get me in. Um, because I, I, I was not a great student in high school, certainly beginning of my high school career. And, and um, I think he saw a lot of potential in me and he believed in me. And I'm still appreciative of that to this day. Um, and, and St. Lawrence is an unbelievable school, like great facilities, um, tremendous academic profile. Um, so that's that's kind of how I how I landed there. Gotcha. But the fun thing about you is you went from being six member on that team at Salisbury to now being conference player of the year. And then yeah. you did something that was pretty rare back then. You bumped up to the D1 level to go to George Washington. Tell me yeah. how that progression goes from six man at, 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 a, at a single A prep school to yeah. rookie of the year to now mid-major program. Walk me yeah. through how that happened. Because a lot of players now are getting recruited to D3s and the D3s are saying, hey, we'll develop you and help you go D1 or D2. You were kind of the OG at that. Talk to me about that. <laughs> Oh, uh, well, I appreciate that praise. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, like I said, I was 6'6", 175 pounds soaking wet. And into the summer from from St. Lawrence or from Salisbury to St. Lawrence, I, I can remember I was still playing AAU and, and, and continued to get some interest. But it was like doing another prep year. And I don't know what the rules were then. There were a couple of schools that wanted me to do another year. And, and I mean, I can't remember what they were. Um, but I was like, no, I'm, I'm going to St. Lawrence. And then, I don't know, someone just clicked for me. Like, it just, I can't even explain it, like, looking back on it. It was just, um, like, this confidence that, that kicked in from an offensive standpoint, from all, all areas of the game. And, I mean, right off the bat, um, I was able to make a, certainly an impact at St. Lawrence and definitely in the league. Um, and it was a good, it's, it still is a good league. Then it was Liberty League or now it's Liberty League. I can't, I can't recall. Um, but, you know, definitely a, a really competitive league with good players. Um, and I was, I was able to certainly come out of the gate um, and making an impact. And, and again, part of that was Coach Downs who believing in me. And then I loved my experience there, had great friends and was, and was doing well. But I, I needed kind of like a shift um, from getting to something different. Um, go, being, growing up in the middle of nowhere and going to high school in the middle of nowhere and and being up at St. Lawrence where it's pretty isolated, like I, to be able to have the opportunity to shift to GW with like, I, I, I've got to do this and, and I want to do it. And it wasn't, it wasn't easy. Um, and how I got there is kind of a roundabout way. Um, and a little bit funny how things work out in life. Um, but with a new staff at GW with, with coach Hobbs and coach Peichel, um, who's who's now obviously Steve Pico, the head coach at Rutgers, um, and Carl Hobbs, who was the head coach at, at GW at the time. They were new as a new staff, and they were getting things off the ground. Um, and there was a young crew coming in when I transferred in, so it was kind of like adding an older piece um, and what they thought was a mature piece um, to the, to that to that unit. Um, and I was, I certainly, <laughs> I was, um, but that, it it was like kind of like a the perfect storm at the time for me for me to to be a GW, which was, I mean, A-10 at that time was a big-time league, and it still is. So, yeah. But Rock, and I, did you I grew leave? three inches, too, so that helped. You get three inches at St. Lawrence. Yeah, I grew – I mean, I was – you know, I was – showed up 6'6", six, six, and, and by my sophomore year, I was 6'9", you know, 225. So, um, I can't explain that either. Um, it, that's just something that happened, too, and that, I don't think it's necessarily normal. Um, so. But walk me through this. So – the game, and you you just told me, but I'm not need to ask this again. Like you said the game just started clicking. Is yeah. it? Did you put extra time in the summer? Do you have a trainer? Like, what do you attribute that that click to? Or is that that you don't know that yet either? Yeah, I think that I don't know anyone who had a trainer then in in 
in uh, 1999 or 2000 or 2001. Like, I don't, I don't remember any of my friends or any guy that played AU having a trainer. It was a lot of play. I played in a lot of summer leagues, a lot. Um, and I would drive a great distance. Um, I played AU in, in Boston with a team greater Boston at the time, which the head coach at Endicott, Kevin Betancourt, who went to Bucknell, like Kevin and I were on the same AAU team. And um, Danny Lawson, who's an assistant at UMBC, Danny was younger. Um, Danny was on that team too. Um, and uh, I mean, driving at a great distance for, for, for AU. And it was a lot of play, a lot, of, a lot of, um, a lot of five on five, just in this area of, I mean, again, I can remember driving all over just to find a game, but mm -hmm. I, I, I honestly, I have no idea what just clicked. I really don't. I think in part of it was because I would play a lot with, with my roommate, Wayne, who was, again, he started every single game at Tulane or something crazy like that. And he still has a school record in steals and conference USA. I think he, I mean, what was a conference USA? Um, I mean, he's up there in, in the record books and I think playing against him and then being that at St. Lawrence, um, I, I don't, I just, again, I was just, was like, I, I can help, help this team. I can help lead this group. And it's again, it, it wasn't like a moment. It was just like being in it and, and taking advantage of it. So, and then again, having coaches that believe in you are part of it too. Yeah, absolutely. And then, so without the transfer portal being what it was, like, how did the transfer to GW go? Did, did you want to get out of St. Lawrence? Did you get someone that reached out to you? Was it a middleman? Was it, what was that like? <laughs> I don't even know if I'm able to say. <laughs> okay. If you don't feel uh, comfortable saying it, that's okay. Yeah, but I think the no, statute of limitations has run out too. So <laughs> keep, that's true. Keep, keep, keep it however it, you're saying it until you need I'll to keep it, it. I'll put it to you this way. Um, I mean, part of part of transferring is believing in yourself. And at that time when there is no portal and there's no social media platforms like there is now and highlight tapes and all that stuff. I mean, you, you, to put your name out there and, and change from schools. And there was there was reason for me to do it outside of basketball. And I was having a great basketball experience. Um, again, I love St. Lawrence. I have great friends and still have great relationships with with um, with my former teammates there. Um, but the opportunity being in D.C. and part of like going to school like GW was, was something that, that I, again, there was a lot of luck behind it. There was a lot yeah. of luck behind it, but it was also, you got to kind of create, you know, those situations that present themselves. You, you've got to, you got to go out and grab it. And I mean, it was nothing short of packing my car with a couple of bags of clothes and really going down and playing pickup for coach Hobbs and coach Pikes and coach Brodus and coach Brooks. Um, and showing what I could do in a five on five segment to where being in the class two days later, like sheesh that quick. And, and if it didn't go well, I was, I was going to hop back in my car. Like that's the rea the reality of it. So um kind of betting on myself and having someone make a phone call for you and saying, Hey, you should take a look at him and, and, and he can play like that's part of it too. But then you've got to go out and do the rest. And but let me ask you this. Yeah. Yeah, you you sure did. But let me ask you this: This is the last thing I'm gonna I'm gonna peck on this because I think it's fascinating of your finding out your mindset on this. But like, what happened at St. Lawrence that said that clicked in you that said I could play at the D1 level? Was there a game during the season where you just dominating practice? Was it something a coach said? Like, was there one moment where it switched and you're like, No, I can I want to try this. Um. I mean, during that summer, freshman, sophomore year, I was playing against some Division One guys where I felt I was better than who were in really mm. good leagues. And then um, I kind of plateaued a little bit in my sophomore year, and I was a little bit frustrated with myself. And I, I don't know, I felt like I, I wasn't getting all that much better and wasn't necessarily my teammates' fault or coaches' fault. It was just something internal with me that I was just – I was I was kind of just stagnant with things, and I wanted to change. Um and again, was lucky to have that opportunity to change. Uh, but knowing that I'm probably not going to have the same production or same impact at a place like GW because of the jump, because of what the league was, and being content with that, that, you know what, I'm, I'm, there's a good chance I'm not an all league player. There's a good chance that I'm not going to start every game. There's a great chance that maybe I'm never going to be the first guy off the bench, but you got to be content with that. And, and that was something that, that I had to, to really, um, to really um, think about and be comfortable with it and still be like, okay, well, I'm going to go earn it. And 
and I think I put myself in a position where, um, you know, being on the court and, and making an impact, um, I, I, I'm still, I'm still content with how it went for me. And what was the biggest difference you noticed between D3 and D1, both as far as programs go and style of play and physicality? Oh, there was so much. Um, there was so much. Like, I couldn't, I couldn't be in, like, official practices at the beginning of the year. I can't remember what it was. Um, maybe it was, like, it was uh, compliance stuff. Like, I, I couldn't remember. Um what it was. So it was like the first month and they were doing training with the strength coach and I could see what guys were going through and they're getting about five in the morning. And sometimes they're earlier, like the coach Hobbs and, and they're really trying to get, develop a culture within, within the program um, and, and get us off in the right direction. And part of that is showing up on time and doing these little things. If you don't, well, we're going to get up at four thirty, and, and you're going to be with the strength coach and you're going to be doing up downs like that. That was part of it. And, and, um, I still had to get up and do those, even though I was not able to because I wasn't I wasn't cleared yet. So on the side, because I wanted to stay in shape with the rest of the guys, I was doing my own stuff on the side to make sure when I was in it that I wasn't fault that I that I wasn't um, you know the that I wasn't falling behind in any way. Um, so that was the biggest difference, like the the level of commitment, like just the where they were trying to get the program in that direction and in the direction that they wanted things to go in. And I mean, there were some awesome players there too. Um, Awesome players and really good, talented, younger players where you could see, Hey, if we get things going next couple of years, we're going to really do something special. And and I think that, that we did. And it's something that really, I think is hard for programs nowadays because a lot of those guys maybe would have transferred. That's right. Yeah. What was the best part of playing D1 and the worst part? Um, and there's so many good parts. There, it was it was really terrific. And again, being with a group of, of guys where, I mean, we, we won Atlantic 10s in 2005 and, and some of the guys on the team, Pops went to Bansu, who, who's, um, you know, working as a, as a, in the G League right now, I think with the Knicks. Um, and then Mike Hall was in the NBA and J.R. Pinnock and Carl, like Carl Elliott, TJ Thompson was terrific. And TJ's assistant at Rutgers. And, and, um, it was just a Chris Monroe is the leading score, all time leading score in GW's history. He was there the first year of the year I'd sit out. Um, so just being around like unbelievable players, like that was part of it. And during the summer, there was pickup where there was some pros coming in. I mean, Richard Hamilton and Ray Allen and around profit and, um, I mean, it was just, it was uh, Rod Strickland. Like it was awesome. Like it was just great to be in that space and being at GW was terrific. And, um, the hardest part is that it, it can be cruel. Like I was hurt and it's hard to get back on the floor. And I started, I don't know, five, seven games in my, in my two years of eligibility, which, which getting to, you know, I was starting my first game I ever played against that at, at at St. Lawrence was against uh, SUNY Potsdam. And then all of a sudden, the first game I started GW was against West Virginia. Like, there's a lot in between that. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm certainly, even at that time, I was like, I was fired up, of course, like anyone would be. And then um, you got to hold on to it. And then when you get hurt and guys get better, I mean, things happen. And that, that's the reality of, of um, Division One athletics. So, but I would, yeah, trade. Just- I would not trade it. What a, what a great experience. Let's go back to St. Lawrence real quick. What was the best and worst parts of playing at the D3 level? Um, bet, the best parts for me personally, I, I had great teammates. Like, it was awesome. And I think there was there was far more room for me to, like, make mistakes and, like, learn from them. I think, you know, in Division One, you you maybe have a little bit more of a quick hook. And Coach Downs was re- really, really patient with me. And I think I, hopefully I made it easy for him my, my, my freshman year. But um, great teammates, and and I think the league was really competitive. I think one of the, one of the worst parts, um, I don't know, I, I, I can't necessarily pinpoint like a, a worst part about it. I mean, one time we got in like a snow a stuck in a snowstorm between Canton, New York, and getting to play at Williams, and we were like stuck in upstate New York on the road for like hours, and then we didn't get to play at Williams until it was like nine p.m. Um, so that was a tough. Tough game to play in. 
a tough game to win. Um, and, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, you know, there's different parts to it. Like the travel at Division Three is totally different than the travel at, at Division One at that time. Um, it was just so many, so many different, different pieces to it. So, A lot of bus time. Yeah. A lot of van time. Okay. Not even bus. A lot of van time. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Well, after G-Dub, uh, you then played professionally overseas. Tell me about that experience. Yeah, I mean, it was great. I actually, um, because I, for my injuries, I had to have a surgery. So then I worked at Coaching Academy for a year um, oh, where cool. I, I coached, um, I coached JV basketball and JV baseball and I taught history and, and it was great. Um, and I was, I was going to stay at Cushing cause they hired me to be the head coach at, at, uh, I don't know, 24 years old, which looking back on that, I'm glad I, I did not fully take that position on because I think it would, knowing what prep school is right now, I think it would have been tough for me. Um, not having the experience that I was able to gain, you know, 10, 10 years later, but, um, then I, I, I went to play and it, and it was terrific. And, you know, a team is going to take it a chance on you. Um, you know, being a guy who was hurt and had um, not a huge impact on a division one roster, but was still on a really good team. Um, but it, it, it was terrific. It was great. It, it really was. But as a player, it's, it's then you see kind of the writing on the wall. It's like, how much further could you go? And, and there's certain decisions that you got to make. And yeah, I would have liked to play until I was 35, but would it have been worth it? I don't, I don't know. Where'd you play overseas? What country? Uh, I was in Germany. And what was the best part and worst part of playing pro in Germany? Um, I remember being in gyms and there were people like smoking in the gym. That was tough. <laughs> um, <laughs> and one of the best parts is you see, I saw things that, that were not, I hadn't seen here in the States. Like one of my teammates would drink Coca-Cola on the bench. Like that was not, I'd never seen that before. Um, but we were running, doing a lot of actions still that you like see right now that I hadn't been running. I hadn't been, I haven't even, I wasn't even exposed to at, at GW. Um, so that was pretty cool. Um, so yeah, but it, it was a lot of fun. Great. And now you're the head coach at Loomis, JV. How long have you been there? Um, so just finishing up my ninth year. Awesome. Yep. So tell, tell people that don't know about your school, like a little bit about Loomis, JV, um, what, what you're looking for in players, what kind of program you're running, you know, tell, give us the elevator pitch. Uh, I mean, Loomis is an amazing place and the location of the school is terrific. Um, being right in the center of right in between, um, New York and Boston and being 15 minutes away from Hartford. Um, we're a school of 740 kids. So this is like a mini college campus and our facilities are incredible. Um, the campus really is like a, like a college campus. And I always say it's kind of like the best of both worlds. Cause you feel like you're like isolated at a boarding school, but we're right in the center of town where you can walk to town and go to a grocery store and go to a coffee shop. There's a CVS, there's things like that. Um, so it's really easy to get to being 10 minutes from the airport. And again, you've got this college feel, um, and really everything is here for, for kids to be successful. We're able to find that balance of their studies and, and, and their, their gym time, um, but while also continuing to, to grow as, as young people, um, because this is not college athletics. Um, you're working toward becoming a college athlete and that that's the whole point. Um, but I'm a little bit biased. I think, I think Loomis is, um, before I got to Loomis, I was at Cheshire and I always saw Loomis as a place where like, man, they could be awesome. Um, and, and I think that, um, we've gotten to a point where he has some terrific players and we won New England championship. And I think that, um, we get everyone's best effort, whether it's a triple a AAA school in Timor or whether, um, if we were playing a class C school, I think we would get everyone's best effort. And, um, I, I like that. I like that. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. We're going to play a fun game now and I'm going to name three alum from your school and you tell me if you know them or not and what they do. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> no pressure. Uh, George Schultz. Of course. Yeah. Uh, worked in the Reagan administration and actually he coached or he played basketball here at Loomis. Awesome. Yeah. U S secretary of state. Yep, secretary back in that state. administration. Yep. Perfect. John D Rockefeller, the third. Jeez. <laughs> um, third, second, first. Right. I don't know what the Rockefeller the third had accomplished. Um, we do have Rockefeller quad uh, as part of our campus. 
Um, I'm not exactly sure what he what he accomplished from a, a a business standpoint. Yeah, I don't either. I just he's a, it's a Rockefeller, <laughs> so cool to put him down in there. And then last yeah. one, Catherine Watterson. Oh man, you got me there. Okay, she's an actress. She's been in Steve Jobs. She's been in Alien Covenant, oh. Fantastic Beasts, and her dad is Sam Watterson from Law and Order. So, oh, okay. I think I I, I want to say we someone was talking about that in the office not too long ago. So, okay. Yeah, every every prep school if you go to Wikipedia has a baseball player, a hockey player, uh, some NFL player. It might be from the nineteen yep. twenties, yep. but uh, I left yep. those out. But anyway, that was this week's edition of famous <laughs> alumni from the prep school we're talking to. So, thank you for playing rock. Yeah, really. are there are there any other uh names you want to mention of like notable people that have gone through there that kind of on the top of your head i mean our most notable is henry kravis um who um just made a you know very very generous donation to the school and he's probably the most well-known um alum of, of loomis chafee and what's he do where do he get his uh his money um he, he he's in finance he started what's called okay. kicking out. Yeah. great great um Tell me, you work in admissions, and what's the benefit of being the basketball coach and working in the admission office? Um, benefits. I mean, <laughs> I think it's uh, being able to meet families here and being able to tour them around, and and I think always being able to offer hey a central point of, of meeting in the admissions office and and you know walking around campus from there, um, and and absolutely you know guiding families through the process. Um, and understanding what the process is here from starting out with the inquiry and getting application in and, and how things work then on the back end. Um, you know, and and families who are applying for financial aid, like being being able to um guide families through that and being in the admissions office is always a little bit easier um than maybe a coach who's not um in the admissions office. Um but um we have a we're in a great position as a school with twenty five hundred applications. So um, from from around the globe, um, so we we get a really uh, diverse applicant pool, and that that definitely is also um, I could speak to that certainly for basketball too. I mean, we get kids interested from all over the world too, just like a lot of prep schools do as well. So, yeah. And what are some tips you can give? Like, obviously, if you're coming through the basketball, that's great. If you got talent in the court and you got decent grades, but in general, like what? What makes a package or what characteristics does a kid have on top of basketball and grades that might make them appealing to a school like yours? Um, well, I think that what's appealing about Loomis, okay, is, as I spoke to before, is location of the school, the campus itself. Like when people come and walk around here, they're, it's, it's an amazing place. And our facility, our gym is incredible. And, and um, our weight room with our strength coaches is an incredible space. Like that stuff. I think definitely maybe surprised a lot of people who who have never been here to campus before um, and are just learning about the process or if they've been to another school, then they come here and they're like, Oh my goodness, like this is incredible. Um, that, that happens quite often. It happens quite often. Um, and then from the academic standpoint, it's all dependent on when a, a student is planning to enter in. Like being a post-grad is very different than entering as, as a 10th grader um, just from a, a core standpoint, a grad requirement standpoint, it, it's very different. A post grad, um, it's certainly basketball is a big factor, but it's also what do they want to get out of it from an academic standpoint and getting kids to think start to start to think that way. Um, for ten, for tenth graders coming through, it's more about um, um, what do I take? What am I going to be in my junior year? What am I taking my senior year if I have reclass? Like things like that. Um, so it's always different conversations um, with family families depending on um, what entry point that they they uh, plan on um, applying for. Um, but the campus itself, I mean, it's it's in a lot of ways it, it's it's an, again it's an incredible place. Um, so I feel yeah, like let me re, let me re, let me restate that question. Like when you're looking at candidates trying to come yeah. to Loomis, like on top of basketball and top top of academics, like what other traits are you looking for oh. at Loomis of like the applications you're getting, like what's like, Oh, this kid checks all these boxes. Yeah. We're going to go after him hard. Like get, tell the people that are listening, like on top of basketball yeah. and academics, like what else a kid can bring to get on your all's radar. Yeah. Um, I mean, you have to, you have to love like to play. I mean, as a basketball coach, I want to coach guys who, who love to play and everyone might say, Oh, I'm, I think I'm a divisional player. 
that's that's where I want to be at. But it's like, do you do you really love it? Because you have to 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 get to that to that level. Um, you have to want to get in the gym by yourself. Like it's great to get in with your trainer. It's great to get in with an assistant. It's great to get in with me. But you have to be willing to get in by yourself and and get up two hundred shots between class. Like again, it comes back to to what what do you want to get out of this game? Um, and I think that that's really important. And it's, that's something I say that a lot of kids can't answer a ninth grade, a 14, 15, 16 year old kid. They just, they love to play, which is great. Um, but do you really love all, do you love all aspects of it? Do you love doing things that you, you don't necessarily, you're not good at doing right now? Like that, that's part of it. Um, so those are questions that I always ask, uh, but I, I feel like I've been really lucky. We've had kids who are gym rats. We've had have had kids who who love to play, and um, I've always loved guys with length. Um, I think that if you look at our college placement of guys who are six sizes and above, it's it's pretty incredible. Um, and at the same time, we've had guards who are tough and and can make plays. Um, but really, I, I think I've always been a little bit biased toward guys with size um but it's also hurt us a little bit when we've played teams <laughs> where it's a tough defensive matchup for us but um we've had a lot of success with you know your undersized guards or undersized forwards too um it, but it all comes back to like your motor and how much you love to play and how much you're willing to get better um so it's really it's finding those guys and, and trying to get some of those questions answered when they're here on campus and and maintaining having those discussions and it's not just one discussions one it's not just one chat on the phone it, it's multiple um so it, it's not it's it's never easy and and kids nef- definitely do have choices nowadays um, which is great and it's definitely helped the prep game and it's helped a lot of kids um so it's it's also finding the kids who who see Loomis as a place that they really want to be at gotcha and then what does it take for a guard to play at the D1 level these days oh the reason um, I ask that is there's so many guards out there that reach out to you and me, and that's yeah. a majority of teams, and a lot of them want to go D1. So, Yeah, unfortunately, right? Six-foot guards, they grow on trees, right? So how do you separate yourself? And, <laughs> and one of the things that I, I've always talked about with guards of that size um, is like I once played pickup GW with a guy named Shante Rogers. Okay, and Shante was an incredible player. Sweet 16 with GW. I saw him defend full court the entire two hours of pickup pickup basketball defending full court that is a huge separator like that stuff gets noticed if you're a college coach on the sideline like who is willing to defend full court like you a lot of guys can shoot a lot of guys can dribble there's some incredible passers a lot of guys can talk but are you willing like to defend full court full court like i'd never seen that before um, it was like mid July, like who, who would do that mid July pickup? He would. So my advice to, to any guard at, at six, two or below do something that nobody else is doing. And mm. I, you don't see a lot of guys doing stuff like that. And you can't necessarily yeah. practice defending full court. You can get in shape and work on your strength and work on your endurance. But do you want to do that in a game? <sighs> It's tough. That's a lot of this. That's a lot of heart right there. But that's a separator. That's yeah. a, that, is, that is a huge separator. That stuff, it gets noticed. It gets noticed. All right. Walk me through this in admission. So when you have a ninth grade class coming in, you've got X amount of beds for them. Probably it just changes a little bit year to year. But as far as, you know, a 10th grader coming in, 11th grader coming in, a reclass 12th, a postgrad, like, how do you determine how many beds are available for each class? Is that determined by how many kids leave each year? Or do you add a couple beds each year to each class to take kids coming in in different grades? Well, luckily, I never crun- have to crunch those numbers. Uh, that's for my, <laughs> for my uh, our, our dean of enrollment and director of admissions. They get to look at all that stuff. But, I mean, how it, it, it does work, yeah, it's the amount of kids that are graduating and the size of the current class. And usually a typical ninth grade class at Loomis is going to fall between 100 and 120 students. Um, and then depending on that, what that number is, it's like we can add this many sophomores and then this many juniors and then this many postgrads. Um, so every, your class is getting added to, which is dependent on how, how much 
um, what that number looks like year to year. Um, but in all, a typical graduating class at Loomis is going to be somewhere between 200 and 210, 212 students. Yep. So you're adding a lot during the four years kids come in as freshmen. They're getting new classmates every year then. Yeah. Yep. yep. Interesting. Okay. And we um, have a day student population too. So our day students, um, we're 30% day student at Loomis just because of where we're located with West Hartford and Avon and Glastonbury and Longmeadow, Mass. It's, it's, again, it's very easy to get to within 30 minute drive time. Um, even if you're sitting through some traffic in Hartford, which is definitely possible, but, um, it's definitely a, ba a delicate balance um, for our admissions office with um, the amount of available beds on campus than with our day student population, because Loomis used to be a, a school of 50-50. So, um, and, and with, with adding dormitories, it was a shift from being 70-30, 70% boarding, 30% day student. So, gotcha. It's not now easy because we always, we always have tremendous applicants and, and a great applicant pool to choose from. Um, from all sports, all walks of life, all interests. Um, so, so it's definitely, it's hard for us, but it's, I, we, we know it's even harder, harder for families too. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, thanks for sharing that. Um, Loomis is single A and a question yeah. families ask me a lot is like, well, shouldn't we want to play at triple A or double A versus single A? And I know about the differences between, between the classes and how much, I don't think it matters one bit, but you tell me how you answer that to families that might be concerned about you being a single A school versus double or triple. Yeah, I mean, I always say that you've got to look at where um, some kids from class A are going off to school. Like when you see um, there's a lot of division one schools that that are getting kids from from class A and that speaks to the strength of the, of the league. Like it, it is it is tough. Like, again, a school like Milton has been awesome and and they started <laughs> what boston college purdue harvard and princeton their starting lineup like i'm pretty sure that there were some double a's and triple a's that did not have that um i want to say it was a good amount of them so i i think it's for for folks it's tough for them to if if they're unfamiliar with it to kind of get a grasp of what what is with the different classifications and is it better to be triple a better be double a than a is it better to be a than b i mean there's some b schools that are ter that are terrific there's so i think it's a lot of beauty in the eye of the beholder but um i always talk to families about where kids have gone from loomis and where kids have gone from the rest of the league um and you've got guys in, in the nba who played at, in class a so um on any given night you can have a awesome class a school you know, it'll be a dogfight for a triple A school. So And tell me about Loomis. Where have some of your players ended up over the years? Um, yeah, it's it's a really it's a good variety of schools. I mean, most have been division one kids. Um, I mean one of our Jaden Delaire, who was Gatorade player of the year in the state of Connecticut. Um, Jaden went to Stanford and then he did a, a fifth year at San Diego and and he was in the G League this past year and, and will probably either be in the G League or overseas next year, doing really, really well. And um, Nate Santos, who starts at Dayton right now, Nate started at Pittsburgh, and Nate was here for three years, and he was tremendous. And R.J. Blakeney, who was at Dayton, then went to Old Dominion. And Duedo Newberry starts at San Francisco. Josh Menard just graduated from St. Anselm's and is doing a fifth year at NYU. And uh, Jesus Cruz played at Fairfield. He, he plays professionally in Puerto Rico. Um... Quincy Samuels just graduated from, uh, or he graduated from GW, but then he he did a fifth year at IUPUI, and and um, you know it's it's been uh, it's been a great run, a lot of, a lot a lot of talent, and it makes it easy for me uh, as a coach. Um, but the the guys have loved to play. They've loved to play. Uh, that's that's always that's always been the goal here to to really have have a good group of kids who love to play, and their goal is to get off to play college basketball and. What level we'll figure that out, and that's that's on them. That's a big part of how they can help themselves figure that out. But you got to you got to want to get in the gym, and and a kid like Jaden is still getting in the gym. A kid like Josh is going to be in the gym tonight. So um, these are the guys that I've had had to come through the doors. And talk to me about how you place kids now in this in this current market with the transfer portal. Um, you're on the phone a lot, <laughs> whether it's 
calls, texts. Um, you're just really on the phone a lot, and um, it's 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 not easy. Um, but really, the goal for this this last group was to make sure that everyone was was set. And it's like having yeah, there's there's plan A, but we've got to have a plan B and a plan C, um, just because of how how um, how uh, just interesting things have gotten from a recruiting standpoint uh, with the portal. So, um, you know, having a lot of conversations with your kids and, and, and it's hard for them, right. It's hard for you. And, and there's not, there's not a lot of clarity to it um, because it's like, Oh, school's following me now on, on Instagram or on Twitter. And if you want to reach out to them or we'll reach out to them, there's, there's a, there's a lot of that. And then a lot of follow-up calls. I mean, it's just, it's, it's, really maintaining constant communication with coaches. Um, and there's a lot of movement on their part too. I had a coach who, who was at one school and recruited a kid, but he really wasn't interested in that school. And then he went to another, another school where the kid would want to go to. So again, that's maintaining the, that relationship. Um, that, that's a big part of it too. Yeah. It's all about relationships. It's a, it's a, yeah. it's a network of, of uh, people that know each other, that have known each other for years. And yes. I've always said that guys like you rock, you're advocates for these players and you need an advocate in this day and age. And to me, there's no better advocate than a prep school yeah. coach like yourself, right? Yeah. With that big Rolodex you got. Yeah. And a big selling point too is, is coaches. Have, they, they have seen now kids come from Loomis who now yeah. have made huge impacts on some high top 25 teams. So, um, you know, saying, saying to a coach, it's like, Hey, you got to come take a look at this this kid. I think I think they 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 start to they realize it too. They realize it too. Um, so that that's paying off. At the- Rock, we're gonna get into some uh, quick hitters here, okay? Yeah, nice. Uh, best biggest win of your uh, coaching career? Biggest win of my coaching career. I mean, we won New England, but. I mean, that was a great win. But I mean, this past year, the game against Milton was a tremendous game, and it was double overtime. Like that was an awesome game. That was an awesome game. That was fun. That was fun. What about your biggest win as a player? Huh. Biggest win as a player. Oh my goodness. I forgot most of them. You remember the loss? <laughs> I didn't play in this game. Uh, I don't know if I did play in this game, but we won at Dayton and a last second shot, but it was like a runner from half court. Um, my teammate Carl Elliott stole the ball. You can still see it on YouTube. He stole the ball and it was like a crazy runner from half court. That was one of the most incredible games that, I, that I've certainly been a part of. That was fun. That was cool. Awesome. Who's the uh, best player you ever guarded? Uh, we pl- I, so I started against West Virginia. And then the next day I had to start against Gonzaga. Um, and Roni Turioff was their center. So he was pretty good. He wrapped me and uh, he dunked right on me. Wrapped me like it was like first possession. They called me out some ISO in the post. And I was running because I don't know 260 and I was 230. So he wrapped me, threw me right away, and, and dunked it. He, he was that, that was tough. That was tough to guard. Tough to guard. Ne- but, but never really, good for the ego. Right. It's never good for yeah. the ego. And the, they call it an ISO and you're guarding the guy and you're the guy getting yeah. ISO'd. So thanks for the assignment, coach. Right. <laughs> yeah. I got it. But, um, How about. Go ahead. Uh, even every day in practice, like Pops meant to bounce. Who Pops is so athletic, and if anyone wants to look up footage on Pops, like they'll see, like that dude, and he got better and better and better. Um, but he was, he was, he was tough. To yeah, that remind Pops a buddy of mine from DC, so I'm going to get him on here because he went to prep school himself. Um, yeah. yep. So that'll be a good story. And I actually saw him play when I was in Istanbul, Turkey, randomly. Yeah. And uh, yeah. so yeah, Pops a fr- friend of the program here. Who's the best player you ever coached against? Like that just blew you guys up at oh. the prep school level. Cormac Ryan like dropped forty five. No, forty on us in New York City. We played them, and that was that was Jaden Delaire's year. Cormac, yeah, he he <laughs> he lit it up. Um, when I was at Cheshire, we played Canterbury, and Canterbury had a young Donovan Mitchell, and um, Coach Keo and I. We decided before the game we were just gonna have two guys guard Donovan the whole game. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think he still had like 25. We won, but um, it, it was uh, it was a wild game just to have two guys basically face guard. And it, and I think when he when we were on offense, we also we we made sure that we had a second guy near Donovan too, 
going down in transition. So there was always at least someone near him. So it worked out. We we probably lucked out that one. <laughs> <laughs> What's your favorite movie? Favorite movie. Or one of them. Um, Goodfellas. Always my favorite movie. Good call. And lastly, what are your hobbies when you're not coaching? Oh, I've got three boys, so 10, 7, and 3, so they keep me busy. And that's the, that's the best hobby that you could have. Um, they're, they're a lot of fun. So it's, it's, uh, it's uh, just hanging out with them and watching them grow up. Like that, That's a great hobby. Mm-hmm. Is there anything else you want to touch on that we didn't mention in this podcast? No, nothing at all. I, I certainly I, I appreciate the, uh, the invite. It's been a lot of fun, and um, I, I would love to come back anytime. Yeah. Where can people find you if they're interested in reaching out to you or learning more about Loomis Hoops? Yeah, so um, obviously on the website, um, Lewis Chafee. And then if you go to admissions, you can find my contact info. Or if you go to athletics, to varsity boys basketball, um, you can certainly um, – uh, find me there, shoot me an email, um, but also on Twitter, uh, Coach Battistoni, or just on Loomis Basketball uh, uh, Twitter. Um, you can find me there as well. So, yeah, feel free, feel free to reach out. Yeah, perfect. And Rock, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, this is Rock Battistoni, head coach of Loomis Chafee, uh, single A school, great education, great basketball. Thanks so much for coming on. If you like this podcast, be sure to subscribe on all the major podcasting platforms. Subscribe on YouTube, where we also release bonus content. And any questions that come up, go to prepathletics.com, sign up for the newsletter, reach out to me. I'll answer any question you got on prep schools. And uh, just keep tuning in so we can keep sharing great information and great guests with you. So thanks so much. We'll see you next time.